Here's a neat little observation. If you take a solution of glucose in water and you add a high concentration of sodium hydroxide and you let that solution sit for a few days and come back and measure what you've got in there, you'll find that you no longer have just a solution of glucose. You have a solution of both mannose and glucose. And fissure projections for the open chain forms of mannose and glucose are drawn right here. If we stare at these long enough, we'll realize that the difference between D-mannose and D-glucose is at carbon two. D-mannose has this configuration, D-glucose the opposite configuration at carbon two. Sugars that differ in configuration at one stereocenter like this are known as epimers, and the interconversion between these sugars is known as epimerization, the interconversion of two epimers that differ at one and only one stereocenter. So they are diastereomers that differ at one stereocenter. This is what we mean by epimers. How in the world does this happen? Well, the base is key. And the base is key because this reaction is predicated on the idea that the alpha carbon to the carbonyl group in sugars is mildly acidic. It's alpha to an aldehyde or a ketone, so it's something like a pKa of 20, and we'd expect an even lower pKa for carbohydrates, to be honest, right? Here, we've got an aldehyde, which is gonna make the pKa quite a bit lower than 20, something like 18, 17, and we've got inductively withdrawing hydroxyl groups in the neighborhood, right? So that's gonna pull the pKa down even lower. So 20 here as a benchmark is a little bit too high, given what we know about the structural effects of everything else in, in this molecule. But in any event, it's mildly acidic. And it's acidic enough to be deprotonated to a non-negligible degree by something like hydroxide base. That deprotonation creates an enolate. And we can think about reprotonating at the oxygen to generate an enol tautomer of that enolate. So now that I've laid this out, let's step through it step by step here. So deprotonating at the alpha carbon and flowing the electrons up to the carbonyl oxygen creates this enolate. That enolate is nucleophilic and Bronsted basic at both oxygen, and this resonance form makes that clear, and the alpha carbon. There's another resonance form that's worth pausing and drawing with negative charge and a lone pair at the alpha carbon there, at carbon two. If we protonate the oxygen, we get to the enol tautomer of the starting aldehyde. And notice, this is not just any old enol tautomer. There was a hydroxyl group linked to carbon-2 in the original monosaccharide, and that hydroxyl group is still there. What we have here is what's known as an enediol, something with not one but two hydroxyl groups and a 1-2 relationship connected to an alkene. So it's an enediol, and that enediol has two acidic hydroxyl groups that could be deprotonated to create two different enolates. We're gonna come back to that on the next slide. For the time being, the thing I want us to notice is if we go back to the original enolate by deprotonating where we just put a proton on, we can add a proton at the alpha carbon as well. So for example, water comes along, we flow electrons back down, and we protonate the alpha carbon. But this can happen two different ways stereochemically, right? This is gonna create a new stereocenter at carbon two. It's gonna create a new stereocenter right here because we're establishing a new CH bond right here. And that stereocenter could have one of two configurations. If we put the hydrogen right back where it was, we'll end up with glucose. But if we put the hydrogen on the opposite side from where it was, we end up with mannose. So here, for instance, if H2O comes from below this enolate, putting the H on the bottom face, we end up with mannose. And if the H2O comes from above, putting the um, H on the opposite side, we end up with glucose. And of course, these will equilibrate, right? Because these proton transfers are very, very rapid. And so given enough time, we're gonna reach an equilibrium mixture of D-mannose and D-glucose involving a little bit of both, right? Um, non-negligible amounts of, of both. And what happens over time if you start, for example, with pure D-glucose is you start to see some D-mannose build in, right? That's sort of Le Chatelier's principle in action and that we started with no D-mannose, it's gonna build in over time. This kind of epimerization tends to be very slow and require high concentrations of base because of this pKa issue. That alpha carbon is not that 
base, uh, acidic, right? But it's something that we can definitely observe when we leave sugars in base for long periods of time. On the last slide, we introduced this idea that carbon-2 in D-glucose and carbon-2 in any aldose is acidic. And we can deprotonate at that carbon to create an enolate. Reprotonation at the carbonyl oxygen creates an enol, and not just any old enol, but an enediol because there are hydroxyl groups at carbon-1 and carbon-2, both linked to the carbons of the CC double bond. So this is an enediol, or a 1,2-diol, uh, if you like. Now, one thing we note that I, I didn't note on the last slide that I want to note now is this is a tautomerization process, right? This enediol is a tautomer of the starting uh, hydroxyaldehyde structure, if you like. And the enediol is very special. On the last slide, we saw that we can just reprotonate the alpha carbon to create the epimer of glucose, convert glucose into mannose. Now what we're going to notice is that this OH is also acidic. It's just as acidic, if not more acidic, than this OH, right? And so it's possible to deprotonate here. And notice this leads to an enolate that is not the same as the enolate we generated over here. These two structures are not the same. And if that's tough to see, pause to verify this. In this structure, we've got an O minus at carbon two. In this structure, the O minus is at carbon one. These are constitutionally isomeric enolates. They are not the same. And in this enolate that we've generated here, well now the, the basic carbon, the Bronsted basic carbon is carbon one, right? Think about resonance in this enolate the nucleophilic and Bronsted basic carbon is carbon-1. And so we can protonate at carbon-1 via this enolate. But notice what this does. This puts the carbonyl group at carbon-2. In essence, what we've done is we have walked the carbonyl group from carbon-1 to carbon-2. And in so doing, we have converted D-glucose into D-fructose. Now we get a sense of why these are very important biochemical sugars. D-glucose can very easily turn into D-fructose just by a series of proton transfers, right? We did two proton transfers to accomplish this first tautomerization, a third proton transfer to get us to this isomeric enolate, and then a fourth proton transfer to get us to D-fructose. And this reaction kind of blows my mind, right? Because it looks like a reduction at, at carbon-1, yes, a reduction at carbon-1, and an oxidation at carbon-2. But the entire process just involves proton transfers, right? Taking protons off and putting protons on to shift the double bond between CNO at carbon-1 to CNO at carbon-2. And it's all equilibrium driven, right? So if we start with D-fructose, it's possible to isomerize D-fructose to D-glucose, migrating the carbonyl group from carbon-2 to carbon-1 via the exact same mechanism for proton transfers just happening kind of in the reverse direction or backwards in time, if you like. I don't want to leave you with the impression that these carbonyl migration and epimerization reactions are very quick on a laboratory time scale. They generally take hours, days, weeks. They take a long time to get done if we want synthetically useful amounts of, say, fructose from glucose. But they're still worth studying. And I'll give you one reason, and there are probably more reasons than this, but one reason why these reactions are worth studying. They likely occurred under prebiotic conditions, and they provide an explanation for the structural diversification of sugars, if you like, on Earth before there were organisms around with enzymes that could accomplish these kinds of uh, isomerizations under catalytic conditions in seconds, right? Before those enzymes and those organisms existed, these kinds of reactions were the only means by which sugars like fructose and mannose and other sugars could form, right? These epimerizations and isomerizations actually provide a mechanism to explain the prol proliferation of all the different hexoses. If you think about epimerization and carbonyl migration working together, as long as we've got six carbons and we start with a sugar, it's possible to envision a mechanism to generate any 
aldohexose or ketohexose starting, for example, from glucose. So these reactions were hugely important under prebiotic conditions, more than likely. And don't just take my word for it. If you're interested in this, check out the Center for the Origin of Life or COOL Center at Georgia Tech. We've got a lot of people working on questions like this in chemistry and biochemistry at Georgia Tech, and it's something that interests a lot of people around here.